In 1989, Star Trek V The Final Frontier was a notable disappointment at the box office. Reeling from bad reviews, the movie only grossed $49 million domestically off of a $33 million budget. That's a pretty worrying figure for a franchise when you consider that the previous film, Star Trek IV The Voyage Home, had made a huge $133 million. It likely eventually eked out a profit, but it did badly enough that the studio was looking to reboot the series without any of the original stars by making a Starfleet Academy movie. Harvey Bennett, the producer of all the films since Star Trek II, thought this would be a great way to continue the big screen adventures of the crew, but eventually Paramount saw the light and thought differently. With Star Trek The Next Generation picking up momentum on TV, it became clear that Captain Picard and company would eventually move to the big screen. But given that the franchise's 25th anniversary was right around the corner, the time had come to give the original crew the major big screen send off that they deserved. Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country. What are we doing here? Maybe they're throwing us a retirement party. That suits me. I just bought a boat. This had better be good. I'm supposed to be chairing a seminar at the academy. So unnecessary. Now, 1991 was a heck of a year to be a Star Trek fan. It was the 25th anniversary, and at only 10 years old, I remember it very well. They reissued all of the old films on videotapes in this cool collection where the spines, if you put them together, made out the Starship Enterprise, which as kids, you know, we all tried to do. Sadly, Gene Roddenberry, the creator of the series, would actually die just before Star Trek VI would come out, giving the 25th anniversary celebration a bit of a bittersweet feel. And to many, this movie ranks as one of the best entries in the series. Part of this may be due to the fact that after the Star Trek V debacle, the decision was made to allow Leonard Nimoy and franchise vet Nicholas Mayer the chance to spearhead the movie's development creatively. In the years since Star Trek IV The Voyage Home, Nimoy had become a hot director, with Three Men and a Baby, the biggest hit of 1987. However, since then he'd had a few flops, including the Diane Keaton, Liam Neeson drama The Good Mother, and the Gene Wilder comedy Funny About Love. Mayer also had a few flops, such as the Pierce Brosnan adventure movie The Deceivers and the Gene Hackman thriller company business, which barely got a theatrical release. Nimoy, who had just wrapped Funny About Love, wouldn't direct this one, allowing Mayer to return as director for the first time since Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan. Yet things would be different this time, with Nimoy having a lot more clout, having directed the most popular Star Trek movie of all time. Harvey Bennett was out, with the rumor being that the cast wasn't happy with his idea of making a Starfleet Academy movie, which was described by some as Top Gun in space, and would have only featured cameos for Shatner and Nimoy, with everyone else getting the shaft. Nimoy would essentially be his replacement. I have personally vouched for you in this matter, Captain. You have personally vouched. One thing Nimoy always did well was that he knew, at its best, Star Trek functioned as an allegory. For the fourth film, he addressed the plight of the humpback whales directly, and the decision was made to broach the topic of Glasnost with this film. At the time, the Cold War had finally ended, with the Berlin Wall having come down and relations thawing between Russia and the US. Chop. <laughs> what? What are you doing here? I just drop by with present for warming of house. Instead, find you grappling with local off. Oh, brought some of your commie friends to help you fight dirty, eh? Star Trek VI is written by Nicholas Mayer and his protege, Denny Martin Flynn, would address the easing of tensions between the East and the West directly. The movie actually starts with a very thinly veiled version of Chernobyl happening, with the Klingon moon Praxis being destroyed after an accident, poisoning the Klingon homeworld. The former enemy of Starfleet now has to pursue peace, with Spock acting as an intermediary between Starfleet and the Klingon on Empire. He is opposed by Captain Kirk, who harbors deep-seated prejudices against the Empire after the events of Star Trek III, where his son David Marcus was murdered by a rogue Klingon commander. As he tells Spock in one of the movie's most heated moments, Let them die. Nevertheless, duty wins out over prejudice with Spock volunteering the Enterprise to escort the Klingon Chancellor Gorkhan, the movie's answer to Mikhail Gorbachev, to peace negotiations on Earth. Gorkhan is murdered under Kirk's watch by two of his own crewmen, with him and McCoy, whose attempts to save Gorkhan being misinterpreted by the Klingons, ending up imprisoned on an ice planet. Meanwhile, Spock and the rest of the crew try to solve the assassination conspiracy and clear Kirk's name. Perhaps you know Russian epic of Cinderella. If shoe fits, wear it. Mr. Chekhov. 
I'd wager that of all the Star Trek movies, none has a better script than Star Trek VI The Undiscovered Country, as it serves as both an allegory while also functioning as an action-packed adventure. The whole crew is well served in this one. Shatner, who may have been smarting from the reaction to Star Trek V, delivers one of his best performances as Kirk. His prejudice and feelings as both a father and a Starfleet officer are given a lot of focus here, but rather than make you dislike Kirk, it makes him more human and relatable than he's ever been. To be or not to be, that is the question which preoccupies our people, Captain Kirk. We need breathing room. Earth, Hitler, 1938. It's one of the most interesting takes on Kirk and Spock's relationship too, as it depicts the fact that despite being like brothers, they are two very different men, with Spock the diplomat who sees the big picture, while Kirk is blinded by his emotions. You're a great one for logic. I'm a great one for rushing in where angels fear to tread. We're both extremists. Reality is probably somewhere in between. Yet, the movie also allows Spock to be vulnerable, with him having a protege, Valeris, played by Kim Cattrall, who you may of course know from Sex and the City. Originally, this was supposed to be Savick, but Christy Alley didn't want to return, and given that she turns out to be a traitor, all involved thought this might be too jarring. Spock's relationship with Valeris proves how he isn't above being blinded by his own feelings, and there's a great, if controversial, scene where Spock performs a mind meld on Valeris against her will, with it being the most morally compromised we've ever seen him. Meanwhile, DeForest Kelly, in his final go-round as Dr. McCoy, gets a lot of screen time, with him and Kirk stuck on the frozen planet Rurapente, where they meet Iman's Marsha, a shape-shifting alien who betrays them. What is it with you, anyway? Still think we're finished? More than ever. Everyone gets a little something to do here, especially with Sulu being upgraded to Captain of the Excelsior. Nice to see you in action one more time, Captain Kirk. Take care. The supporting cast is one of the best ever assembled for a Star Trek film, with David Warner returning from Star Trek V, but as a different character, Chancellor Gorkon. Star Trek The Next Generation gets a shout out with Michael Dorn playing an ancestor of Worf's, the Klingon attorney, who defends Kirk and McCoy. Brock Peters as Admiral Cartwright returns from Star Trek IV, and in a shocking move, he turns out to be the mastermind behind the assassination conspiracy. Best of all though is Christopher Plummer as the movie's one-eyed villain, General Chang, who has an eye patch bolted onto his skull. In space, all warriors are cold warriors. Plus there's also a cool cameo from Christian Slater, which I vividly remember got a huge reaction in theaters when I saw it as a nine-year-old back in 1991. Sir? You have hearing problems, mister. No, sir. It's all expertly directed by Mayer, who, despite working with a budget lower than the one they had for Star Trek V, peppers in some amazing set pieces, such as the show-stopping zero-gravity assassination of Gorkon, which George Clooney admitted in interviews he referenced in his Netflix movie, The Midnight Sky. While ILM's absence had been sorely affected in the terrible effects work in Star Trek V, the company returned for this one and did top shelf work despite a small budget. It takes a lot of effort. I don't doubt it. In some ways, the lack of money paid off. In his memoirs, Mayer admits that he wanted James Horner to return and score Star Trek VI. The budget didn't allow for it, and after entertaining the notion of scoring the movie with Gustav Holtz's orchestral suite The Planets, Mayer stumbled upon a demo tape from a young composer named Cliff Eidelman, who wound up delivering one of the best scores in the series, which is saying a lot considering that, at least as far as the original cast movies go, the scores have always been really good. <laughs> Unfortunately, Gene Roddenberry would not live to see the film's release, which came at Christmas of 1991, right in the midst of the 25th anniversary celebrations. Star Trek VI The Undiscovered Country did much better at the box office than the fifth film, grossing $74 million domestically, which was pretty good considering it only cost about $30 million to make, and it almost broke $100 million worldwide, eking out about $99 million. Is it possible that we too, you and I, have grown so old and so inflexible that we have outlived our usefulness. This no doubt earned the studio a very nice profit, but it would turn out to be the swan song for the original crew, with only Shatner and in much, much smaller roles, James Duhon and Walter Koenig returning for Star Trek Generations. That movie would launch the next generation cast on the big screen, for a while anyway, but that's a story for another day. They will continue the voyage as we have begun and journey to all the undiscovered countries, boldly going where no man, where no one, has gone before.